The Iroquois call it the Dark Times. A hundred year war. It climaxed in an epic battle between an evil tyrant with supernatural powers and a great warrior who became a prophet of peace. This is the history of America as you've never seen it before. When French explorers first ventured into these great northeastern forests 500 years ago, they encountered a people whom they call the Iroquois. They ruled a vast territory in what is now New York State, Ontario, and Quebec. The French were impressed by the physical prowess of these giants of the forest. What they didn't realize was that the Iroquois system of government was extremely sophisticated and far more democratic than their own. But the path to peace and democracy was long and often bloody. The ancestors of the Iroquois had lived in this area for thousands of years. At first, they were hunter-gatherers. When food was plentiful, times were good. When it wasn't, they moved camp. Then about a thousand years ago, archaeological evidence indicates they began to cultivate the land and form villages. The villages grew into nations. Five separate nations stretching across what is now western New York into Canada. Up to 50,000 people in all sharing similar languages and lifestyles. But despite their similarities, they turned against each other. Soon war was all they knew. The land was in turmoil. Feuds among villages, even among families, turned men into warriors who liked to kill. For generations, the Iroquois have passed down the story of the Dark Times. When the people of the Five Nations were locked in an endless cycle of violence and revenge, so bloody it threatened them with extinction. Everywhere there was peril. In cultures with oral traditions, the line between legend and history is often blurred. Yet in recent years, much of this story has been verified by historians and archaeologists. Iyanwatha, sometimes called Hiawatha, lives among the people who raised him, the Onondaga one of the five Iroquois nations. Yet he's not entirely one of them. His mother was a Mohawk, probably captured in battle. Since boyhood, Iyanwatha has had to prove himself. He has become a leader of the Onondaga, a great warrior.
But the wars have exacted a heavy toll, robbing him of his wife and six of his seven children. Yet he must fight on. His village has been attacked once again, this time by the Mohawk. His people clamor for revenge. Iyanwatha leads his men east. They know they're being watched. And not only by Mohawk scouts. The chief of their own nation, the Onondaga, has spies everywhere. Some take human form. Others are shadowy creatures of the forest, especially the owl, the Iroquois omen of death. The Onondaga chief is a sorcerer, a shaman who manipulates the evil spirits. His body is distorted by seven crooks. His hair rides with snakes. He feeds on human flesh. His name is Taradaho. He lives in isolation, far apart from his people who fear him. Though the Onondaga have other chiefs, Tadadaho holds supreme power. To him, Ayanwatha and the warriors are pawns in a game. Tadadaho relishes bloodshed. War feeds his power. As long as the chaos continues, his reign is secure. As Tadadaho's spies look on, Iyanwatha's men prepare to attack. The Mohawk often come to this river to fish. It's within their territory. The easternmost of the five Iroquois nations. But even here, they are not safe. The Iroquois are locked in a hundred year war. A civil war. Iyanwatha and the other Onondaga warriors are bent on revenge. In retaliation for a recent attack on their village, they want Mohawk victims, both dead and alive.
During the period the Iroquois called the Dark Times, revenge was not a choice. It was fundamental to their belief system, the way they honored and mourned their dead. To the Iroquois warriors, every death had to be answered by another. The battles dragged on and on. The only alternative to revenge killing was the taking of captives. A healthy captive of the same sex could serve as a replacement for a person lost in a previous battle. But transporting captives was risky. If they loosened their bindings and escaped, they could gather others to pursue the raiders. The Iroquois bound their captives carefully with hemp ropes, the same substance they used to carry burdens. This was also a symbolic act, a way of conveying possession to their enemies. On their way back to their village, the Onondaga warriors follow a path the Iroquois have blazed through the wilderness. It stretched for 240 miles. Today, this route is a highway that runs between Albany and Buffalo. But a thousand years ago, the warriors ran these miles, forcing their captives to keep up. Along the way, they boasted of the size of their victories in pictographs. At night under the stars, Ironwatha camps with these men all of them are weary of war. The legend says that Ironwatha longs for a better life for his people, but can see no way out. He cannot know that many miles to the west, a child has been born who will show him the way to peace. Far to the northwest in the land of the Huron, a virgin girl gives birth to a baby. She and all the Huron in their village realize the child is blessed and was put on earth for a reason. They call the baby Skenalahawe, but in time he would come to be known as the Peacemaker. The archaeological record left by the Iroquois attests to the fear in which they lived during the dark times. Towering stockades surrounded their villages. The only way in was through long corridors designed to confuse and slow attackers. Inside the stockade, each clan lived in one or more longhouses. A clan was made up of many families related through a common female ancestor. In Iroquois society, women enjoyed power and freedoms that would not be experienced in Western cultures for hundreds of years. As time went on, 
the oldest and most respected woman in each house became known as the clan mother. These female elders presided over village life. They appointed the male council chiefs and could also remove them from office for poor performance or abuses of power. In four of the five nations, this collaborative system of government flourished. The sole nation in which it did not was the Onondaga. There, Tadadaho reigned supreme. There is only one person he allows close to him an evil seductress named Chikansase. She shares his zeal for war and his craving for chaos. The whole village turns out to greet Iyanwatha and the victorious warriors. They form a gauntlet, a double line for the male prisoners to pass through. A female elder presides. She is looking for replacements for her dead sons. The gauntlet is a test. It reveals which captives are strong. And which ones are not. Iyanwatha has lost his stomach for the violence. His daughter is the only one who still brings him joy. Inside the stockade, the sorting process continues. The Mohawk women and children find a ready home. Men who survived the gauntlet are now offered to families who've lost a husband or father. If accepted, the replacements will take on the identities of the dead and assume their names and responsibilities in the village. But those whom the elders reject face a very different fate.
The Iroquois today tell a story of the years before their great confederacy, when they were locked in a bloody civil war and lost all sense of their own kinship. In those days, life was valued as nothing. Everywhere there was peril. Here again, the archaeological evidence agrees with oral history. In a kitchen midden, or ancient garbage dump, in Jamesville, New York, scientists have unearthed dozens of bones. Some are recognizably human, with cut marks where stone tools separated the joints and stripped away the flesh. A hundred miles away, archaeologists found two skeletons with their arms, hands, and feet severed. One is also missing its head. Flint arrowheads are deeply embedded in the bones. The broken points suggest the arrows were shot at close range. In the ashes of a campfire were found charred human remains, hard evidence that the victims were not only killed, but cooked and eaten. The legend says that Ayanwatha is sickened by the ways of his people and his own violent part in it. Yet he fears Tadadaho and continues to obey him. Sensing he is losing Ayanwatha's loyalty, the evil tyrant and his supernatural agents monitor his every move. Tadadaho will not tolerate any threat to his power. Finally, Ayanwatha begins to think the unthinkable. Could he bring down this brutal man who cares nothing for his own people? Tadadaho's powers are extraordinary. No one has ever dared to defy him. What Ayanwatha still doesn't realize is that help is on the way. In his Huron village, the young peacemaker grows tall and straight. Even as a boy, he's revered for his leadership skills and powers of persuasion. As a young man, the peacemaker learns about the terrible war raging across the lake far to the east. He realizes he has a divine mission to intercede. One day, the peacemaker leads the villagers into the forest. He hacks off the bark of a maple tree and asks his people to taste the sap. If it is sweet, he says, peace will come. But if it turns bitter and runs red like blood, that will mean the peacemaker's luck has run out and the evil one has destroyed him. Then, in a magical canoe of white stone, the peacemaker sets out to fulfill his destiny. As the peacemaker paddles east, 
Ion Wantha grows stronger in his resolve to remove Tadadaho from power. He too has recognized his destiny. The great warrior will attack the evil chief. Under cover of darkness, Ion Wantha and the Onondaga warriors prepare to attack the remote longhouse of Tadadaho to overthrow their evil ruler. Their task is formidable, but the men are determined. As always when facing battle, they paint their faces to terrify their opponents. Black, the color of war. Blue, for strength. Red, the sign a man is ready to kill or be killed. Their weapons are sharp and ready. Hatchets, axes, and flint knives. Developed for hunting, repurposed for war. Their bows and arrows are state-of-the-art. Unique spiral of fletching makes the arrow spin. This stabilizes flight and increases accuracy. Their fearsome clubs were developed strictly for combat. The most common is called the Gajewa. Its long shaft is carved from ironwood with a heavy ball at the end. What the warriors don't realize is that these weapons will be useless against the supernatural forces of Tadadaho. Ayanwatha knows he may never return, but it's a risk he must take to try to save his people. Ironwatha's war party inches toward Tadadaho's isolated longhouse. shaman is ready for them. Tadadaho uses all the dark creatures of the forest to fight the forces of good. Arrows fly from everywhere, yet there are no archers. From his longhouse, Tadadaho has been fighting on two fronts. He's worked his evil magic in Ironwatha's village as well.
The tyrant has spared Ironwatha, only to destroy his soul. The great Iroquois leader, Ayanwantha, has been defeated in battle. The death of his last surviving daughter at the hands of the evil Taradaho has broken him. He wanders, dazed and lost. But the peacemaker draws closer every day. Skenalahari has journeyed hundreds of miles across the Great Lakes, bearing his message of peace. There are many versions of what happens next. One holds that Iron Wantha comes to the shores of Lake Ontario. He finds shells which remind him of his daughter's necklace. At that very moment, the peacemaker appears. Ainwata. He consoles Ironwantha for his loss and points out how the shells are opening his heart and allowing him to mourn his daughter. Skenalahawi teaches Ironwantha that shells like these, when strung together, are called wampum. They offer an alternative to the endless quest for vengeance. A better way for the Iroquois to honor their dead. Ayanwatha feels the power of the wampum. The rage and hate that fueled his days as a warrior vanish. He accepts the peacemaker's message and resolves to carry it to his people. This task will not be easy. The Iroquois have known nothing but war for generations. But Ayanwatha and the peacemaker set out to convince the five nations to abandon war. Their first stop 
is the land of the Mohawk. Not surprisingly, they are met with suspicion. In many versions of this story, Iyanwantha is cruelly tortured. Leo on a dog haga. It's a Leo. Finally, the peacemaker convinces the Mohawk chief to listen. Skano, not the army. So what the whole set up? Kind of go. The chief agrees to support their cause but only if the other nations will take up the challenge too. The people of the Standing Stone, the Oneida, are the next to accept the message of peace. They are joined by the people of the Great Swamp, the Cayuga, and the people of the Great Hill, the Seneca, until there is only one nation that remains apart. Iron want his own people, the Onondaga. The time has come once again for the new disciple of peace to face down his blood enemy, Tadadaho. The warrior Ayanwatha is now a man of peace. He is ready to confront Tadadaho, the Onondaga tyrant who has terrorized his people. Ayanwatha has won the support of the rest of the chiefs and all the female elders of the five nations. Even Tadadaho's evil ally, Jigansase, has repented her ways and joined the procession. According to the legend, the power of their singing draws Tadadaho from his dark longhouse. At first, the evil tyrant mocks them. His power is based on chaos and revenge. To him, peace is weakness. And then something happens that even Tadadaho cannot ignore. Another coincidence of history and legend. Until recently, most historians and archaeologists believed that the Iroquois formed their union sometime between the 14th and 16th centuries. But the Iroquois themselves always placed the event much earlier. Only one astronomical event agrees with both oral history and scientific evidence. On August 31st, 1142, a great eclipse blocked out the sun for a dramatic three and a half minutes. Tadadaho understands his tyrannical reign is over. Ayanwatha and Chikansase comb the snakes from his hair as he relinquishes his powers.
This is the moment when the five nations establish the great law of peace to rule their relations. They form a new united government. Tadada who was appointed head of its council, and Jigonsase, the mother of nations. The transformation of the five nations into the Iroquois Confederacy is immortalized in a wampum belt. At its center is a white pine tree, symbolizing the unity of the Iroquois nation. To this day, it is known as Ironwatha's Belt. Under a great white pine on the shores of Onondaga Lake in present-day New York, the warriors lay down their weapons. They bury the hatchet, a phrase that lives on today. From this moment, their internal battles will involve words, not weapons. They form a grand council made up of representatives from each of the five nations. This idea of proportional representation would inspire another set of nation builders 700 years later. The founding fathers embraced this idea when writing the Constitution of the United States. They also adopted an Iroquois symbol. In the words of the peacemaker, one arrow is like a single nation or state, easily broken. But a union is unbreakable. The image of an eagle holding a bundle of arrows is central to the great seal of the United States. Today, the legend of Iron Watha and the Peacemaker lives on. Not only in the laws and traditions of the Iroquois Confederacy, but at the heart of democracies all across the world.